Amen. Thank you for all of our worship leaders this morning. If I start naming all of the groups that have been up here this morning, I'll leave one out, I'm sure. But I'm so glad that they've dedicated their time and their energy to leading us to the throne of grace this morning. If you have your Bible, and hopefully you do, if you've got your smartphone or your tablet or your Bible app, whatever that is, go ahead and open it up to John chapter 4. We're going to begin a new series of messages this morning. Let me ask you, just, to, just for you to think, kind of a rhetorical question this morning, who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? And maybe you're here this morning and you've not worked that out fully in your mind and in your heart about who Jesus really is. But I, I've been led to go to the book of John, take you there to the book of John, as we go through John's gospel, uh, not verse by verse all the way through, but hearing what Jesus has to say about himself. And I've entitled the series of messages, The Great I Am. And we're going to look at Jesus in his own words. What is Jesus, who does Jesus say that he is? What does Jesus have to say about himself? Hopefully that will clear up what we believe about Jesus. Amen. John's gospel is unique. His concern is not so much the chronology of everything that happened with Jesus, and including all of the events in Jesus' earthly ministry, but at the heart of the gospel is that question, who is Jesus? Jesus. Jesus said multiple times, I am. When we hear those words, I am, we're reminded of the Old Testament and how God is revealed in the Old Testament as the great I am. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me. And be blameless. In Exodus chapter 3, we know the story. Moses is out tending the flock of his father in law, Jethro. And as he's out in the wilderness, he sees a burning bush. And as he approaches the bush, God speaks to him through the bush and tells Moses, He's sending Moses to Pharaoh to tell Pharaoh to let his people go. And then Moses said, well, listen, if I go and I go to tell Israel that God is sending me and I go to the Pharaoh, who am I supposed to say that you are? And listen to what God said. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say th this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. And then in the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, therefore... My people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day, they shall know that it is I who speak. Here I am. In John's Gospel, these are known as the I am statements of Jesus. And they relate back. And they, they relate back to this statement about God Himself saying, declaring Himself as the great I am. Now, a lot of commentators want to say there's about seven of these. If you really do some digging in John's Gospel, you can find nine or ten of the I am statements of Jesus. And they're always this construction. I want to see you. Now, I know you didn't come to Greek class this morning. You came to church. So I'm not, I'm not expecting you to, to memorize this, but we'll see it every time because it's really important. Now, look at the Greek words. It's ego imi. Can we get that up there? There we go. Ego e me. The word ego means I in group. Everybody say I. Okay. So you, you getting it? Ego means I. All right. The next one is e me. And what that word is, is the word I am. It's built into the word I am. It's a being word. And you don't need the I to go before it. But when Jesus uses these two words together, it's emphatic. He's putting emphasis on it. And he's saying, I am. He doesn't need to add the ego at the beginning, but he does. Why do you think he does that? He wants us to remember what God said at the burning bush. He wants us to look back and see the God that was revealed to Israel. To see the God that revealed Himself to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob. And to see the God who showed up there at that burning bush and declared Himself to Moses as the great I Am. 
And so Jesus is telling everyone he's the I am. Now, if you have your, your Bible open to John's gospel, we're going to read what he says to the woman at the well. So would you stand with me? Stand with me. We'll just uh, pick it up in verse 13. John's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 13. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You're right, saying, I have no husband, for you've had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, He who is called Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. You get that? Did you see the I and the am in the statement? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for your word today. God, we ask you that you would come down and abide in our hearts in such a real and powerful way through the study of your scripture. We might turn our hearts to you. We might be renewed. That our joy might overflow. And as we depart from this place, we would go out telling of the excellencies of our God. And Lord, for the story of this woman, who desperately needed an encounter with Jesus. I pray that we would look to her example and we would learn what it means to know the Messiah. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you be seated? Would you be seated? She had been to Jacob's well many times before. Wells had an almost supernatural ability to cause two people to fall in love. After all, Abraham's servant found the perfect wife for Isaac at a well. Jacob met Rachel at a well, and it was love at first sight. As a little girl, she'd come to draw water from the well, and she would imagine the day when she would meet the man of her dreams fall in love, be swept off her feet. She imagined that day, the day of her wedding. With all the joy and all of the excitement and all the festivities and all of the family gathered around and how happy everyone would be when her husband took that vow to love her, provide for her, and protect her. Her childhood imagination could never measure up, never compare to the day when it finally came. It was all that she had wanted it to be. They pledged their love to one another. They started their lives together. They made their home together. And it seemed as if nothing could ever upset that happily ever after ending. She would spend the rest of her life experiencing the joy of marriage. To a man who loved her. How many of you know that's not how the story ended? Rarely does, this, does that fairy tale ending 
come true. All of her hopes and her dreams all shattered in a moment the day that he came home and he said, it's over. I don't love you anymore. I found someone else. She pleaded with him to change his mind. But he was determined. And as a first century Jewish woman, she had absolutely no choice in the matter. He sent her life in a downward spiral. How could she care for her needs? She couldn't own property of her own. She could never earn a decent living. What was she going to do? Months, maybe years later, another man walked into her life. He was kind. He was decent. Treated her like a person. But the pain of that first rejection, that first separation was still throbbing. After time, she began to believe that he is the new one that she should have had all along. So she musters the courage to try this again. Surely he'll take care of her. Just a short while into marriage though, the nightmare is replaying all over again and she's out on her own, desperate, depressed, and dejected once again. Surely no one will ever love her. She begins to believe that she's incapable of being loved. She's now damaged goods. She does the only thing she knows how to do. She finds the first new guy who will give her attention. She gets married again. That doesn't last long. And she's back out on the street and one by one until she's married to her fifth husband. When he kicks her out, it doesn't matter if the next guy will marry her as long as she can stay in his house. This is the context of this passage. Listen to verse 1. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. Listen to verse 4. He had to pass through Samaria. He had to pass through Samaria. Just a context there. A Jewish person going up from Judea through Samaria into Galilee would avoid the Samaritan towns and villages and either go on the coastal road or the much more difficult road up through the mountains. But they would avoid Samaria altogether because they despised the Samaritans. And yet, the Scripture says that Jesus had to go that way. It was a divine appointment. He had to go that way. Why? Listen to the next line. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Joseph's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. So other ladies in town, would go to the well. They'd go early in the morning or they'd go in the evening whenever it was cooler. They'd sit and they would gossip like women do. <clears throat> they talk about their husbands and their children. As long as old women sit and talk about old men. All of those things that she would never have. And over time, she has grown to despise that well. 
She would have avoided that well altogether. I imagine every once in a while she just spat in the well. Because she was angry. And if it were not for the daily necessity of drawing water instead, of avoiding it altogether, she has to go, but she chose the hottest part of the day when no one else would be there so that she could avoid having to have that conversation and that pain of social interaction. So she avoided everyone and everybody and everything. And then, one day, there he is, sitting there, weary from his journey, a Jewish rabbi. He says to her, in verse 7, Give me a drink. Give me a drink. Simple request. But for her, it's a request that is a bit unnerving. Because with all of her past experience with men, and her preconceptions about Jews as stuck up and judgmental and self-righteous bigots, what nerve! A typical man. He only wants anything to do with me. Whenever he wants something from me. And she responds. Are you really going to ask me to give you a drink? You going to drink out of the same cup? You going to drink my water? Now John intervenes here in verse 8 and He says his disciples had gone away to buy food. So he's saying, look, the disciples weren't going to be able to draw the water. And then he also intervenes and interjects here again in verse 9 to explain to us, he says, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And really, literally, the way that should be translated is, they won't touch anything that has to do with a Samaritan. So for Jesus to drink out of her vessel is extremely unusual. For him to even be speaking with her is extremely unusual. And yet Jesus flips the script. And He says, in verse 10, If you knew, if you knew, if you knew the gift of God. And see, that's so unusual for her because all of her life, no one's ever given her anything. They've only taken from her. And yet here is Jesus offering something to her. And he says, if you knew the gift of God and you knew who it is that speaks to you. Hmm. Let me ask you a question. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? You really know who he is. You really understand who he is. And I'm not talking about Christianity. And I'm not talking about do you know people at church? And I'm not saying, do you know the lingo of church? I'm not saying, do you, do you dress well? <laughs> like you're going to church when you come to church. I mean, none of those things matter. The question is, do you know Jesus? Is He a real person to you? Has your life ever intersected with Him? The way it had with her. She never had anybody offer her anything before. Jesus begins to explain who he is. He says, if you knew who it was, you'd say, give give me water. Give me a drink. You have asked him and he would have given you Living water. Now this is confusing because she's been to the well a thousand times. Maybe over the course of her years, maybe tens of thousands of times, she's come to that well. And she knows the well very well. She knows whenever it's going to be, uh, because it's been raining, whether the water, she's going to have to go down deep for it or whether it's dry or not. She knows that. 
She knows everything about this well. She's been there her whole life. And he says, she's, he says, living water. And she says, what? Living water? In her mind, that must mean flowing water. Different kind of water. She, she lives in the first century. She doesn't have the privilege that we have to go to the tap, to turn the tap on, and, or go to the dishwasher, throw the dishes in there, and wash the dishes. And Allison washes the dishes first and then puts them in the dishwasher. And I've never really figured that part out. Some of you ladies can, can explain that part to me. But she doesn't have the privilege of going and, and flushing a toilet. She doesn't know those things. All she's ever known is a bucket and a rope and a deep hole. She didn't have a Brita filter. It was probably not the best tasting water. Probably stagnant. And so whenever he mentions in the land of Israel about a spring of water that's flowing or gushing, she's got to be intrigued. And so she, she says, hey, living water? How are you going to get that? The well's deep. This, Jacob's well is known as a very deep well. It was a good well. But it's deep. She says, where are you going to get You don't even have a bucket. How are you going to get this? It must be down at the bottom of the well somewhere. Further than you and I have ever reached. And he says, no, it's on the inside. And I'll give it to you. It's on the inside of a person. When you think about that, I think about how many times she toted that bucket. I'm going to give you three quick points here. You know as a Baptist preacher, I've got to have points. You thought I was not going to have any, but you're wrong. But I'm going to hit them quick. Knowing Jesus, number one, it's not a burden, but a blessing. He's a blessing to any who call out to Him. And she's thinking, you know, this guy, he, he just wants something else from me, but yet Jesus wanted to give her everything she ever needed. And she says to him, Sir, you know, give me this water so I don't have to come back to this well ever again. I don't want to come back here. Just give me this. Jesus wasn't there to give her a burden, but to be a blessing. But it wasn't the kind of blessing that she was expecting. How many of you know that knowing Jesus is different than anything else? He's different than anyone else. He'll never judge you or reject you. He always loves you and accepts you for who you are. And some of you today, you need to enter into that relationship with Him, but the barrier for you is that you believe that Christianity is a burden. You think that it's about a bunch of rules and regulations. It's about a bunch of things that you have to do, and, and, and you're just going to have to tote this bucket around with you for the rest of your life, getting water out of a well. But Jesus... Jesus isn't just the well that doesn't run dry. Jesus is the fountain of life that will spring up inside of you and become to you more than you could ever hope for, ever imagined. He's not a burden. He's a blessing. And He's everything you've ever wanted, everything you ever needed. And He's right here for you. John's gospel records how Jesus stood up on the last day of one of the feasts in John chapter 7. And Jesus stood up and He cried out and He said, If anyone thirsts. Any of you ever been thirsty? I'm not talking about like, you know, I, I just need a drink of water because I'm a little parched right now. Have you ever, ever been thirsty like you haven't been able to get to water for a while? I experienced that in Indonesia one time, whenever we couldn't get, in, get to some fresh, clean water. And I was really, really thirsty. At maybe just a couple of hours without having a drink of water. How many of you ever been spiritually thirsty? Just felt so dry. Just felt like, you know, I'm empty on the inside. I need my tank filled. I am running on empty. Any of you ever felt that way? I don't know if I can make it through another day like this. Another hour like this. Another minute like this. I'm just empty. And Jesus says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. 
Whoever believes in Me, as the Scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He's not a burden. He's a blessing. And He's the blessing that just keeps on giving. But I want to tell you secondly, knowing Jesus is not a burden, but a blessing. Knowing Jesus is not a religion, but it's a relationship. Knowing Jesus is not a religion, it's a relationship with a real person who loves you. So somehow, Jesus knows her current relationship status, and He tells her in verse 16, which we've already read, Go call your husband. He has just pinpointed the hurt in her life. The problem. And the question in her mind must be, how in the world does He know anything about me and my life? And so she concludes... And she says, I perceive, I, I, I can tell, you're a prophet. You're, you're some kind of religious dude. Anybody ever encountered any religious dudes? Religious nuts? And they tell you, you better get right, brother, or you're going to burn. You know, she's probably, she's probably encountered some of the religious nuts before. She's probably encountered the, the Pharisees from time to time. And everybody who wants to tell her how she ought to be living. You need to get right, sister. You're going to go to hell. She's probably also encountered some of those priests who would say, no, no, you, you're worshiping the wrong way. You need to come and worship this way or do it that way. And so she kind of engages Jesus in the ongoing debate that existed between the Jews in Judea and the Samaritans at Mount Gerizim where they had their temple. And so she just kind of deflects, but she's also kind of got a question. You look, hey, I know what the religious people are going to say. I don't worship the right way. I'm not a good person. I'm not moral. I need to get my life straight or I'm going to go to hell. She understands all that. So she, she says to Jesus, she says, I perceive your prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, verse 20, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place people ought to worship. And then verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me. The word there is the word for faith. Have faith in me, is what he says to her. Have faith in me. Christianity is not a religion, but it's a relationship with a person. You notice there's a difference between believing in someone and believing someone. You know the difference? Can you tell the difference? Just thinking about that for a moment. Anybody in your life that you, you know that they exist, but you're not really sure if you would believe them if they told you something? Yeah. Like some politicians? It's the difference between believing in someone and believing someone. Jesus says, believe me. Believe me. The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. See, it didn't really matter. That debate about religion wasn't really the point. And for people to be so caught up in where and when and how really didn't matter. Pretty soon the Spirit of God in Acts chapter 2 would be poured out upon the people. And listen to me, folks. God's Spirit is here in this place. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Now he's saying that in the plural, and he's saying that where believers are gathered together, we are the temple. Stephen, by the way, lost his head. Not this Stephen. Stephen in the Bible. He lost his head for believing that. That it didn't really matter where you worship. It matters who you worship. And it doesn't really matter how you worship as long as you're worshiping in spirit and in truth. And so, Jesus says, we worship what we know. He said, we have this knowledge. And, and he says, salvation is from the Jews. Not the right religion. 
That's not what he says. He says salvation is from the Jews. You can be saved. Harry Emerson Fosdick said this. He said some people have just enough religion to make themselves miserable. And some of you probably tote your religion around. All the good deeds that you do. That you're a punctual churchgoer. That you're there every time the doors are open and closed. All those things. That my mama was a Baptist. My daddy was a Baptist. I'm a Baptist. You know. I was going to church when I was negative nine months old. And all of those things. Listen. All of those things. You know what Paul has to say about that? He says he count, counted them all rubbish. For the sake of what? Knowing. Knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, he said. So none of that stuff really matters. Jesus is the fountain. And he'll never run dry. And it's about knowing him. Christianity is not a burden, but a blessing. And knowing Jesus is not a burden, but a blessing. Secondly, knowing Jesus is not a religion. Some 4,200 religions in the world. You want to know it sets Christianity apart? In no other religion did the God of that religion enter into flesh and die. No other religion. Only in our faith. Every other religion is man's feeble attempt to grow tall enough to reach up to God. But Christianity is about a God who is humble enough to reach down to you right where you are. But it's not head knowledge. It's heart knowledge. Knowing Jesus, lastly, is not head knowledge, but heart knowledge. The Old Testament includes about 60 different prophecies with more than 300 references of the coming of the Messiah. Can you believe that? Can I tell you something else about those? In 300 references in the Old Testament, by the way, the Old Testament is before Jesus came, 300 references, every single one of them was 100% accurate. 100% true. The Bible is true today. You can lean on God's Word. And yet, when Jesus came, many people didn't believe Him. They saw all the mighty deeds that He did. They heard the things that He said. And yet, they rejected Him. They nailed Him to a cross. And He died there for you and for me. Because we didn't, they didn't believe Him. Someone has said, the greatest distance in the world is the 14 inches between your brain and your heart. If you're here today and all you have is, heart, is head knowledge about Jesus, you know a lot about the Bible, but you've never asked Him to be the Lord and the Savior of your life, you need to make that decision today. Jesus was asking His disciples one day, Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You know, it takes faith to understand that Jesus in this is the Messiah. Maybe some of you have been sharing and you're with a hard-headed friend. You've been trying to tell them about Jesus. And, and you've gone down that road. You've told them about the prophecies. You've told them what the Bible says about Jesus. You've even shared your own experience with Jesus. And yet it's like, well, I'm not really convinced. Well, what's the problem? They've got all, it's, not a mind, it's not a logic problem, it's a heart problem. Heart's not ready. Jesus talked about the good soul that receives the Word. That's the heart that's ready. That's the heart of faith. And Paul, the writer of Hebrews tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please Him. If we're going to come to Him, we have to believe that He exists. And that He's a rewarder of those who seek Him. It takes faith to understand that Jesus is the Messiah. 
And a lot of people probably just thought that Jesus is admitting who he is. Verse 26, it says to her, he says to her, I who speak to you am he. I am. I am. Where does that come from? It's the Old Testament. You, if you're not paying attention, you won't realize this. And I want to give it to you this morning. I want you to understand. Isaiah 52. Jesus is quoting a passage of Scripture directly as he speaks to her. He says, therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day, they shall know that it is I who speak. Here I am. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of the Lord of Z to Zion. Break forth together in singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted His people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared His holy arm before the eyes of all nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Now, Jesus had this passage in his heart and in his mind as he's interacting with this woman who believes that she's unreachable. She believes that she's beyond the reach of God. She's the wrong kind of person. She's been rejected by the people in her life. And now he's here. But the question is, who is he? And I tell you this. Just bow your heads, close your eyes, and you think about this really hard. You ponder this thought. As Jesus sat at that well, eye to eye with her, she was in the presence of the one who created her, who chose her hair color, her eye color, her skin color. He knew everything about her. When, he, when she went away from there, she went away saying to people, he's told me everything I ever did. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, what I want you to understand is that same God is here today. He made you. He picked out your hair color, even though most of you have tried to change it. Picked out your eye color. And He loves you. And He's offering to you the same life that He gave to her that overflowed in joy. And in a testimony to the world about a God who reigns. Listen, if you don't know Him today, today is the day for you. Jesus had to go that way. It was a divine encounter. And listen, today, this is no accident that you're here. It's no accident that any of us are here. This is an appointment from the foundation of the world for you to know the God who created you. If you want to know Him today, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. It's not a magical prayer, but listen. The change can happen. The transformation can happen if you mean this with all your heart. So you just say the prayer. Lord Jesus, I admit to you that I am a sinner and I need your grace. But Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for me. You shed your blood that I might be saved. And so right now, I come to you. I give you my life. And I say, Lord, you can have me. I belong to you. If you prayed that prayer, and you meant it with all your heart, 
Jesus has become your Savior and your Lord. He's your Messiah. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for the gift of your salvation. And for the ones that pray that prayer this morning, I pray now, Lord, for boldness, that they would not be ashamed of their decision to trust you. But Lord, they would become a testimony of your grace right now in this moment. And Lord, you would help them respond to you faithfully in Jesus' name. Now we're going to stand. Would you stand with me? If you prayed that prayer and you've asked Jesus to be your personal Lord and Savior, I want to know about that so I can pray with you and so that we can welcome you into the family of faith. We don't want to embarrass you, but we want to love you. And so if you've prayed that prayer, we're going to invite you to come. Come now. Our, our ministers are here. They're going to spread out and welcome you. You come. Grab a brother or sister next to you and let them know if you did. If you need a church home, somewhere to worship, and you want to join the family of faith here, today is the day for that. You come as we sing together the beautiful song.